starting now. Thank you. Juan. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Um, I remember coming down in October of 2018. We did a West Coast tour. That was a lot of fun, but it's nice to see all of you individually. If I look this way, that means I'm looking at the uh, screen where I see people's faces in the chat. If there's any, if there's any discussions going on. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout this time. It's really all about a discussion. Um, I, I'm really interested in your impressions of these add-ons of what's new in, um, in Claris FileMaker um, as far as the how they're built, cr creating them, using them, the, and so forth. So we're gonna go through a lot of information. I'm here to walk through all of it and Todd is here to interject. Um, when he when he wants or when, <laughs> to fill in the details, <laughs> right, Todd? Are you there? <laughs> Great. Yes, I will be interjecting. <laughs> I'm used to it. It's, it throws me off a bit, but I get used to it. <laughs> um, so you all can see my screen here. Here's our agenda. We're going to talk about what add-ons are and are not. We're going to talk about the types of them. We're going to talk about how to handle them inside of a, a, an app, your app. We're gonna spend some time on an idea about configuration, uh, which I think is pretty important for a lot of apps. And we'll get into that. Talk about creating them and all the details on those. And we will um, not, we will continue our discussion by focusing on some considerations, specifically like uh, some security cons uh, considerations and updating. So let's get started. Uh, make sure I'm active. So FileMaker, Claris FileMaker introduced a couple years ago, actually, I think version 18, maybe 17, um, this idea of add-ons. They were built from FileMaker people, from Claris people, and they were in the app as a uh, something that we could explore. They were very basic and they were using the universal touch um, <laughs> theme. But they started this ball rolling. And in versions 19, they've given us the ability to create them, uh, albeit a manual kind of tedious way. And now we can use them in this latest update. So our definition of these is a complete package of functionality in FileMaker that contains all the FileMaker bits oh. that make the functionality work. Um, Add-ons are just pieces of FileMaker app, an app. They're, they're a collection of, well, we'll look at that in a minute, but it's, it's just an entire package. It's, I kind of liken this now to what we, can, what we think of as button bars or portals. Those things, we draw, drag them onto the layout, we use them for a specific purpose, and we, we do some configuration with them as well. Uh, I'm gonna get very, again, very specific, but add-ons contain everything that it needs to, to run some sort of functionality. If you wanna create a picker or a calendar or a, a star rating system, everything that that needs that the developer has put together is part of this package. Uh, here's just an example. Here's a little button, just a little layout object that you can put in the corner of a screen to, to click on. That's part of the package. So layout objects are part of a package. We also have um, tables. We have tables that are can be part of a package. Although, as we'll maybe explore in a little bit, we don't actually need tables to be part of the package. It seems it, in this example, we have some data records that are coming over to show an example of how it works when it's you know fully operational. But tables are not needed. Schema is not needed for. Uh, for this. In fact, all of this stuff, any combination of this really uh, could be a part of a package. Um, we have um, layouts. Here in this case, we have a picker that's got three layouts that um, you'll use uh, as part of the add-on. Um, we also could possibly have custom functions. In all the add-ons that I've built, <laughs> I've got 20 custom functions that were imported from various add-on packages. And I highlighted the one that came in with this example. And scripts. 
It can bring in scripts as well. Uh, in fact, uh, when we get to that, every script that is in your add-on creation folder file will be brought into the app, it, at, packaged up and brought in as an add-on. Um, add-ons can also bring in, um, bring the, uh, go back here, add-ons can also bring in things like themes. Um, so if your button has a, a certain theme called Apex Red or something, you are, and you style it in your creation file, and you bring that button in that has that theme applied to it, you're gonna get that entire theme added to it. So it was hard to picture, to put a picture of themes in here. I didn't think of doing that very well, of how to do that. But generally it contains everything that it, um, that it needs, that a developer has put together to make it work. Please interrupt with any questions. Um, what it does omit though, is any security settings that you would have in that, that file in which you're creating the add-on. We use FileMaker files to create the add-ons. None of the security settings are brought in as, the, as part of the package um, because they're not, they don't apply to the package of layout objects and scripts and such that, that you may uh, that you're you're compiling together, so that's that's important to know that, and and that's okay because a, 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 an add-on file that we create, as I'll recommend later, is just a one-off file that you would put together some things, compile, put it on a special layout, group them certain ways, and then uh, run the uh, app the add-on creation process. So the security has really nothing to do with any of that. But Jeremy, if yeah. if you if you ha have a script that might reference an account privilege or some, you know, an account privilege set or extended privilege that you've created, well, does it show like unknown? Really, really awesome. Sorry, does it show an unknown reference because it's open over? I would have to guess so. I have not quite examined that, but yeah, that would make sense, right? Because add on uh, the security, all those account privilege sets, extended privileges are not gonna be part of this, so. Yeah, it, it would be just like you deleted them, essentially from yeah. your normal file. Yeah. So okay. they don't come in. Jeremy, can you confirm or deny custom menus? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, somebody's um, gonna ask that question. I, I think they come in, but. I think they do come in, yes. Now. They're not, oh, you know what? They do come in, but they're not the default. So if. Yeah. If you have a layout in your add-on package that has a certain um, default layout, a uh, custom menu, it, the custom menu will come over, but you'll have to go fix that custom menu's default um, setting. Good, good point. So under the hood, this, uh, an add-on is a, an XML document defining the FileMaker bits, <laughs> including, including data um, for, yeah, we, yeah, there's a whole, XML file that holds the data that you have in your creation uh, file that you want to use as, as demonstration. So here's um, add-on packages have a lot of stuff. When you install one at the very end, this is the file, this is the folder. At the moment, this is the folder that we're going to get. There's a lot of XML files here. I'll explain those. There's some um, PNG files. Um, you see that in the kind of the lower right, there's a record.xml, which is holding my record data and, and so forth. Uh, we get specific about some of these. One of these here is the English en.xml. This is the XML that describes the add-on package that I've, I've grouped, all the stuff that I've grouped together, the tables, the scripts, the fields. It describes all of that for the English locale of my file, uh, of my add-on. We can make add-ons that have different locales, many different locales, and that's, you kind of see that over here with the, the first four uh, XML files, you see es.xml, fr.xml. These are, allow us to localize our, our um, add-on package, and then what, whatever we have localized in the creation file will be added to these XMLs and then it picked up by those, um, those FileMaker version languages, FileMaker languages. So there's the XML, it's just, it's just and this, is, this comes all off of that new, uh, well, yeah, it comes all the new script step, save a copy as XML, something like that, that 
we know, I think we are hoping that, that, that this will actually, it does actually define an entire FileMaker app that we could eventually maybe use to recreate a FileMaker app um, minus the security settings. So that's what that looks like. There are places inside of the um, XML packet or the add-on package to give it title, description, category, features, and so forth that are used when we go to install an add-on. Um, we can sort by a certain category um, or see, see add-ons grouped in different categories. And then we can read all about them in the, in the panels. So I, I can show that here. Uh, this is just one that I've created by hand. Uh, this is what it looks like when I create it by hand through the manual process. And I have to go in here and fill this stuff out. So that's under the hood. Um, Add-ons are, are uh, eventually added to the FileMaker architecture app, the, the folder architecture in two places. On, only, it only goes into one of them, kind of like plugins are in kind of two separate places, but they, they're, they're able to be read from both of them. Add-ons are a little bit differently. Uh, first of all, the, the um, add-ons, like the in-product add-ons that are in right now are found in the package contents of the app. You could open that up in, a, in the finder window and dig down and find the add-on modules folder. Those are baked into the app. We're not supposed to, I believe, touch those, you're like get into those and start adding our own because there is a, another location for them, kind of right near the plugins uh, folder as well. And you can see my uh, path over there and all of the add-ons that I have manually created and installed into my, into my, uh, my FileMaker application. Um, now in, um, oh, there it is, nice and big. <laughs> So I've got, I've got maybe 10 or so that I have installed and you can see all the folders there and you can see uh, something else that looks interesting we'll talk about in a second. Um, Add-ons are also um, turning into some sort of like um, add-on plugin kind of thing. I don't know what they call it yet because it's very experimental. This I got from Big Tom uh, when he created it in 19.1.2 the add-on creation process generated those folders that I showed you, but it also generates this little plugin looking file. And this is really useful to pass to other people to install into their FileMaker app as well. If I double click on this, let's say it's on my desktop, I double click on it, it's immediately going to uh, direct the entire folder that's somehow packaged up inside of that into the correct spot in my library, in my, on my hard drive. Yeah, but um, except without the uh, localization changes and stuff, right? Exactly, so yeah, you're right. So this is not complete, it's definitely experimental. It'll only work, um, I cannot go in there and, and update the picture. I can't um, change the description or anything in that, in that um, JSON file that I showed you, not yet. But so I, the next step I think is for them to give us some sort of interface or some sort of way to be able to update everything that's in here before I create this .fm add-on file. You know, one, one way to think of this file is that this is going to be the sort of shareable installer yeah. of, of, of an add-on. So you don't have to go and unzip it and put it in a specific folder. You just double click it and it will install itself kind of thing. And I think it'll probably make it easier for them to eventually just install it from, um, you know, from the marketplace where right from inside the app, you'll just be able to click in and it'll install it into FileMaker itself. But it is incomplete. It kind of works, but it doesn't have, as we just mentioned, all of the abilities that we get when we have to hand edit right now. It'd be interesting if they, maybe in a future version, they introduce a script step called install add-ons or something like we have install plugins and so we'll see what we'll see what's coming up there but we can use this now and we i've passed this this item back and forth to people so this works fairly well so that's what an add-on is it's just generally everything that makes the add-on work and and we'll get into some examples here um so in my mind, there are, and I love that I would love a discussion here. There are some major types of add-ons that I see are are part of it, and we'll get into specific examples. Can, can here. we just can we just uh, brief pause there? 
Yeah. Um, just to make sure that there's not any, any questions right. about what makes up an add-on, and um, and you know, is there any? And we one thing we haven't mentioned is JavaScript, and of course that's what the all the stuff that FileMaker is releasing are, are built with JavaScript. But that's are there any questions or or uh, any clarifications yeah, I, we need to make there around those differences or what's up with that? Uh, I have a question. You you talked about installing into local folders what happens when you serve the file uh, uh it's 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 on your hard drive whoever installs it is on your hard drive so even if it's i'll explain that in a bit but okay. it's stored on your hard drive and then you install it into a hosted filemaker app and it becomes part of that file okay yeah it's it's uh, analogous maybe to the way themes are they start in your folder but when you use them they get put into the file Okay. The only one who has to care about the stuff in the add-ons folder is the developer who's going to add the add-on. Once it's That's added, right. it's, yeah. yep. it's in the, gotcha. Yep. Yep. Hey, so yeah, I didn't mention JavaScript because we want, even though there's a category called JavaScript in the latest update, that's not what an add-on is. JavaScript is not defined by add-ons. Add-ons are not defined by JavaScript. So in fact, I'll show a lot that are not JavaScript based. So. Don't worry about um, worrying about JavaScript for add-ons. What, what, um, I heard one more question out there. Somebody said, hey guys. Me? Yeah. All right, hey, hey guys, it's Steve Abrahamson. Um, uh, I apologize, I got here uh, about 10 minutes in and if this was covered at the beginning, um, I apologize for the duplication, but no there worries. was um, some talk very, very early on pre, um, pre-introduction of the add-ons, something about um, this is the way, this is the special sauce that allows um, an add-on to actually connect to the existing FileMaker stuff that you've got. Yeah. And key fields have to be done in the way that we think key fields are done. And I don't remember if there was something about blessing keys or something like that to make them recognize or having to use FileMaker's defaults, new yep. key fields. How does that work? We're yeah, going to get to that. I'll show that. you that when we get yeah. to the creating because there's a lot of details in that. So, All right. Thanks. Sorry, I'm saving guys. the more detailed stuff to the very end when you're all, you know, brain shot from this. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it'll stick. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, we're speaking generally of these add-ons because I, I, it's just interesting to see what they look like, what they're supposed to be for, and then we'll get into the very nitty gritty. So the way that I see this, and this was kind of stuff that Todd and Chris and Chris and Blight and I kind of just BSed about on our, on our podcast one time where we kind of tried to define the different types of add-ons. And so I kind of see these three and I welcome any more discussion on this, but there are oh. things called full screen add-ons and they are just examples oops, of add-ons that take an entire layout um, and are their entire everything that everything that you need to do it, it is covered it, i'm sorry the, the layout cover is covered by buttons and maybe fields and stuff that make up the add-on and it just takes up an entire layout here we have two basic examples i've got on the right there i've got the dayback calendar add-on this is this is the add-on product there and then on the left is just a, a silly one that I made that takes records and puts them into like um, sort of squares, I call it. And um, you can click on one and go to that specific record. But these are meant to be full screen. They're meant to have all the functionality, the calendar as well, the Kanban board. They actually have buttons, FileMaker buttons that are part of the functionality that take up the, you know, part of the whole screen. So full screen ones, um, they're nice because they interact with, they can interact with data anywhere in your custom app, depending on how you've configured it or, or not if, if you are doing some configuration. Um, so this, these can be dashboards, these can be summaries, these can be chartings of, of stuff all over your file. So full screen are, are those, uh, that's what those are. We call these sneaky, it's kind of a funny word, but they are, to me, they're, they're just part of the layout they're just a, a, a subtle thing on the layout, another object on the layout that does a task, a small task. The, the Kanban board does a lot of stuff, um, but this, in this case here, 
I've got a, uh, a file here that's just got a little timer on there. It's nondescript and uh, you know, it can be used, uh, you know, it takes up very little space and it can be used to time the, the work on this, this task. Um, so I call these sneaky. Here's, I think I got another one. Um, try to find the sneaky widget there. You see it? The toggle. Active. Yeah, it's the toggle there. I uh, just put a little toggle on there to represent if this is, um, I don't know, active or not. So we've got that. It looks nice. And, you know, it's part of the, I can color this. This is just a button bar that I was able to color. I'll show you specifics in a bit. But that's what that looks like. And then um, people at Gearbox have put together these little um, snacks, snack bars. I have no idea where that word comes from, but these are just little bars that appear on the top right of, of any layout in which they're installed. And they are, um, you know, they're there to show some, to, no, to notify a, a user about something about that record or so forth. So these are what I call sneaky widgets. Is that a good word or should we come up with a better word? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I think when we were, I think when we were coming up with it, it was, um, I don't know. There was some reason why it, sneaky was the right word, but it's uh, it's basically you know you, you wouldn't necessarily know you know yeah. that it's that it's an add-on, yeah. um, whereas a calendar it's pretty obvious that it's an add-on kind of thing. So they were sneaky. We could use subtle. Subtle, subtle. Yeah. you know, smaller. I don't know. There, there are some. I think where where Jerem one of the thing reason why Jeremy likes to point these out is that when you're building them, the how you build the like how you uh, you know, what things you might have to be concerned about change a bit, depending on whether you're going for something that's full screen or whether you're going for something that's part of a screen. Oh, yeah. And the next case is going to talk about where it's really, there's almost, there's nothing visible. You have to, you may have to change your strategies slightly on how you do integrations based on those things. So it is a useful concept to kind of think about, um, you know, yeah. how much of the screen am I taking up? Is there any UI? Like, uh, why don't you show, you get some examples of computation. <laughs> well, you kind of blew my joke there. Um, uh, it's invisible. There's nothing there. Yeah. You're just bringing over, um, lay, you're bringing over a, a, a layout to do some work on. You're bringing over some custom functions, a theme. You're bringing over uh, some new calculations, whatever, whatever. One of the the one of the add-ons that just shipped is is barcode generator, um, and that one there's really no UI in the web viewer. There's we actually put a button in there just to kind of. We didn't need to put the button in there, but it was like there because this is the button you need to click to generate your barcode. But there's really none of the functionality of generating the barcode shows up in the UI. And yeah. in fact, you can get rid of that button and you can just control the thing entirely via scripts and never see the UI. And so that's an example of, of computation. And JavaScript in, obviously is a, is a good candidate there because there's a lot of things you can do in JavaScript um, at speed that you just wouldn't be able to do inside of, inside of FileMaker with native FileMaker scripting. So this idea of making something that, you know, maybe does a particular kind of nasty sort through millions of records or things like that. Um, JavaScript is really good at that. It's kind of like, I mean, the, the three classes, if you want to make them a little bit more important. Um, oh, there's a lot of echo. Uh, All right. like application yeah. modules, um, UI controls, and you know headless functions. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Computational headless is good. Yeah. Wow. Right. It's, it's slightly. I mean, those are there's three basic categories. I, I think it's helpful to just kind of figure that figure out what they mean when you're doing the integrations because they will be slightly different. The uh, Todd brought up a good point. The sneaky ones that I call or the uh, control ones. The, they are really more geared towards a particular record in an app. The, um, the sneaky ones that I've built, like this timer, for example, I'll go back to that, that focuses on just this record. And it's, it's the data that you see in the timer there, the little add-on is stored in a field and it's specific to this record. So that's definitely something to consider, especially when you're designing these and you want to figure out how to configure them how do you, how are you going to hook this up to a field on this, in this context? Yeah, it's, it's a good point, Jeremy. I think, you know, that these ones that tend to be controls or these, these smaller things are, are, are usually, um, but these are, these are loose, loose categories, by the way, they're usually going to be bound to the current context. Yeah. Um, whereas the full screen ones 
they they don't have to be bound to the current context at all. In fact, they may have data from the many contexts coming in. So, all right, uh, let's keep on going. Um, so those are the types. Uh, well, well, this is a good point to stop after every one of these. Uh, we'll take a, a breather. Um, anybody uh, have any questions on on just the types and 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 so forth? Great. Okay. So handling. Um, is it, I'm I'm re, I'm going backwards. I'm doing all the easier stuff first. Um, but I want to talk about installing and uninstalling an add-on. Um, into your uh, custom app. Like we said, they're stored in certain places in your, on your hard drive and they can be accessible for you to install them and then you can uninstall them. So let's see if this works. When you install them, the entire package that is part of that add-on gets loaded into your app. The, all of the scripts, the layouts, the custom functions, the themes, the custom menus, the layout objects become part of your app. That XML gets literally sucked into the core of your, the, the code base of your FileMaker app. So even if your file is hosted, it will become part of it, of your file. Just like if you were to drag a picture in from your desktop, that becomes part of the app. Um, this, it's, a, well, it's a little bit different in that this, this stuff actually gets, you know, put somewhere in the XML of the FileMaker file. It's and then of course, it's kind of like copying and pasting schema elements. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. In fact, I was, yeah, I was going to say that, that all of those steps that we had to go through previous to add-ons to copy and paste stuff from one file to the other, where you have to first make sure what you got the, I don't know, we have a whole list of these, like you have to have to make sure you've copied in, over the layouts then, or no, sorry, the tables and fields, then the, you create the layouts, then you create the scripts or custom functions goes in there somewhere. We don't have to worry about it that anymore if we're using this add-on methodology. And that actually is an interesting idea that if you want to copy paste something from one file to the other, you could just internally yourself package it up as a quick add-on and, um, and then you've got it to apply to any other file that you want. So if you've developed a nice navigation system in file A, you can go ahead and walk through the creation process in that same file and uh, let it be part of your next files. And once that's installed, it's usable by anyone that works in that app. Um, so I, yeah. I have a question. Uh, does this include value lists? It does, yes. I missed that. Yes, it does include value lists, yep. Well, this is a way to move value lists and everything basically except security settings. Yes, that's right. Um, I'm curious about fonts because if you mix in a few accidental extra fonts, do you end up bloating the file with font calls? I mean fonts that are pasted into a field or fonts on the... Well, if you define like an ob two objects each with a different font, you're pulling yeah. in that typeset face to the file. Yeah. So I could imagine if you make a mistake in in your add-on and have one item that shouldn't have that particular font, you're pulling it into the target's font uh, file. Well, you're going to pull in all the things, all of the style settings on all of the objects that are on the layouts that you're pulling in. Mm -hmm. So fonts, theme, but if it's in a theme, the theme will handle the fonts. If, you, if you've done oh, yeah. a custom you know, style. I'm saying like mistakes, individual mistakes, not necessarily part of the theme, but just Well, but even if they're, font. even if they're part of a, even if they're, like if you've done a one-off on that, you've taken, you know, whatever the themed button was and you changed a few things and now it's custom. Um, that's going to come in just like anything okay, else. Something to worry yeah. about. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Well, yeah. So themes are, are, are their own challenge and um, we could spend probably the rest of the time on just themes, but uh, yeah. So just again, like, you know, the, I, I mean, I think it's important to, the, the big take home here on what's happening is that it really is like you're copying and pasting these things in the proper order to get it all to resolve, but it's not anything other than that. Like it's not like anything that you would expect to be able to copy and paste into a file. Um, you're going to be able to, and, and you know, you can get that same behavior here. Um, uh, exactly the same behavior here. So 
uh, yeah. So if, if you don't theme everything, then you're going to get all that stuff in. And that could certainly impact performance in certain scenarios for sure. Hey, Karen. Yep. Are you talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, current font references, or are you talking about the font reference cruft that gets um, added to a FileMaker file and can never ever be removed? Exactly, cruft. Uh -huh. Hate cruft. <laughs> hey, you know, I had that flow chart that you created, Todd, in FileMaker 7 era. Yeah. Uh, the order of stuff on my oh, wall yeah. for a decade. That thing yes. got. I used to reference that all the time in support yeah. support tickets, making sure people got everything installed correctly. That almost didn't happen. That was the first thing I ever got changed in FileMaker was to make that possible. Because nice. uh, originally they were going to do copy and paste only by IDs and they weren't going to do names, uh, which was a problem. That was my first, that was my, my first taste of, of, of impacting. This was one like the early ETS project. I, I think it was the first time they ever did ETS was for seven. And they have regretted it ever since. They have regretted it ever since, yeah. <laughs> um, I may be going to cover this later, but when they're doing all this importing, how are they handling conflicts? Good, okay, good question. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll think about that here. The, I mean, the, the first thing, well, I'm gonna actually install it right now on a video here, but the install process brings everything over from, that, from the package. The, if you have uh, like, happen to have a table name tasks in your add-on and you also have one in your file, you're gonna get a tasks too, just like if you were to copy paste it. Yep. Same because in, implies. because it, you're right, Jeremiah, the copy paste in, is really, this is what this, this, we're doing the same thing. We're just copying the XML in the old method, pasting it into here. So, yeah. um, but now we have this back door way to do it. So that's a very important point, which is one of the reasons why, if you look at the add-ons that we built that are in, that are in the product, you'll see that everything is namespaced. And that's precisely for that reason. If you don't namespace the code yeah. that's going to be coming in, you're going to, you could potentially end up with, with mismatches. And, and remember, because it's like pasting, that if you've got something that is referencing something by, let's say, a layout by name, and you have a layout that's already in there, it's not going to make, you're allowed to have, you know, it's, it's going to reference the wrong layout, right? It's going to go to that, to the first one that was in there. So you definitely want to make sure that building an add-on that you namespace everything that goes in. I'll show you. Yeah, I'll show you that example. Those examples. Run the, yeah. run the video. Let's watch it. Well, this is pretty simple. So I'm I'm in the FileMaker. I'm in the tab over here that says add-ons, and I want to bring in that timer. So I go down to the bottom. I click on the word add-ons. I'm going to pause that for just a second. Here's the the list here, I didn't scroll through it, but this is what we have in product now. This is the category. We see a, a little uh, picture over there, as well as some descriptions of them. It, it explains what tables, what layouts, what scripts are coming over. So you can review those at least just here initially. Um, so we do that. It's installed now. So now it's part of our file right here. It's now in this add-ons panel. And it can be used on any layout. It can be used anywhere in this particular file. And now I can, oh, and what it did is it brought in the two tables that were part of the file right there. And it brought in, you can see five records and one record, it brought in some data. It also brought in the layouts that I had put, set up in my timer add-on package. And clear at the bottom, it also brought in the, which you can't see, the scripts. There it is, the scripts. So those are, and this is what Todd is talking about namespacing it, right? We, we literally named it timer so that it's not, it's, you're probably not going to have something called timer sample data, that kind of layout in your regular file. Um, so hopefully, you know, so it should not conflict. So there you go. Now I've got it installed. And just like a portal at the very top or a button bar, I can drag it in and then get to using it. All right. Okay, question. Sorry. Yeah. If, if you do have something called timer, can we go into the XML of the add-on and do a substitute and kind of, you know. I know. I, I would, I would, I would warn against that. Yeah. Um, it, you're a lot, you're going to be a lot safer temporarily renaming what you have locally. That's right. Because that will maintain all your, uh, yeah. 
dependency chain and everything yeah. and then bring it in and then you can go back in and rename after you've got it out of the XML format. So. I, I know of a few brave folks who have tried to um, uh, build an add-on builder that writes all the XML and all of the files that, that, that are required and it, it's, it's not going well. <laughs> uh, technically, it's probably possible, but unless you have the spec for all that stuff, um, I mean, they're all text files. So technically, you could generate whatever you want. I mean, technically, it's, there's nothing binary. There's no compilation step. There are just text files in that folder and, and then, the, and then the, the couple of graphics files. But there's just so much. And the XML documents are not super straightforward and simple. And um, it, would be, it, it would be challenging to go through and hand edit those or even to write some kind of a, uh, something that, that would, you know, Whole, that would just build it from scratch, for example. It, it would be a nightmare. I mean, basically, yeah. without a validator, you're you're just it's it's a disaster. I mean, yeah. even with the internal tooling, if you're if you're including code in your schema, there's a lot of escaping problems still to be handled. Some of them in nine point in nineteen point one, but um, there's still problems where everything works fine in your source file, but once you put it through the add-on compilation process, there's escaping issues with schema even with their tooling so like huh. i would yeah know, i would seriously warn people away from that yeah but you can also double click on the the name of a uh, add-on and change it in the palette on the left you can you can change the name of it yes. oh yeah i don't can. think that'll change what gets installed no you can rename it but it won't change what gets installed Go right yeah. and there have been attempts we'll look at the uh well i kind of briefly showed the xml but yeah, I wouldn't touch the XML. And as soon as they package it all up as in that add-on um, dot fn add-on, we won't have the ability to do any changing of the. I, XML. I don't. It's the people who are on who are in the community probably aware of a couple of of internationalization bugs that have cropped up. Um, and this again comes back to the same concept of we're pasting in. This is really pasting in code. So there were a few places where we're, uh, the where it crops up is pausing for 0.5 seconds. Um, that is not going to, um, if you install that into a, into a file that uses commas for, for decimal points, that will break. So we've just started doing all of our, we don't do 0.5 seconds or any, you know, anything like that in, those, uh, in, the, uh, in the install on timer or in the pausing. Um, we use fractions because fractions work <laughs> everywhere. So it's like that kind of thing. It's, um, there's a couple of those. The other one is um, dates. Um, and certainly when you're coming in on JavaScript, there's a couple of things with internationalization and stuff like that, that is just, uh, it's pasting. And so there's going to be these weird errors that you have to learn to work around. Um, just like you can install, you can uninstall the add-on. It's a simple matter of right clicking on the add-on uh, in the add-on panel and right clicking on it and choosing uninstall add-on. When you do that you're given the option now uninstalling it will remove everything from every thing that was installed all of the package stuff i want to stop here and say right now there's no way for a database analysis tool to um, identify the file the parts of the filemaker app that are an add-on not nothing that dave ramsey has seen because you know they're still using the ddr and that's it's definitely not part of the ddr it might be part of the save a copy as xml it's not it's not it's not so somewhere under the hood it, it there is some identification it's just not available to us you know as we save a copy so <laughs> FileMaker will uninstall it it will remove everything from the package but it does give you the option of retaining the tables fields and record data used by this add-on. So in my cases, and we'll, we'll show specifics in a minute when we get into the, 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 the creating them, but if you are just installing our calendar, the, the in-product calendar, it comes with a sample data table and an HTML table. You would definitely want to remove that because there's no point in having it in your file if you um, are uninstalling the calendar. And also that, this one bit me, so I'll mention it. I thought that it would essentially let you eject your add-on by you. You could say um, you could uncheck that box and then it would leave everything behind, but it would no longer be quote unquote bundled. 
That's not true. It's actually exactly what it says there. It's just the, it's just the record data. Um, so if you, when you uninstall, it's going to uninstall every, even if you uncheck that box, it's going to uninstall your custom functions, it's going to uninstall your scripts and all that stuff. It'll just leave behind the record data. If, if you, ha sorry, right, I'm sorry, go ahead. If you have the timer 25 places in your app and you do uninstall it, every one of those is removed. Yeah. Um, the fields that you, so there's, there's a clarification in when we get to configuration for sure, the, the, the fields that you've configured the add-on to work with and to pick up data from and set back to, those will not be installed because they are part of your schema. Even if you install, created those fields after you installed the add-on, the fields inside of your data tables are not in any way connected to the add-on except through some sort of configuration. However, but, yeah. Uh, it does break if you tether any other table to a, an existing add-on table and then try to unremove it. You get this weird uh, partial deletion of everything well, oh. <laughs> and a Jeremy, leftover table occurrence. Jeremy will get to the relationship creation part, which is frankly, we don't use. I'll just be honest. We don't use it. Um, but, but technically you can, <clears throat> you can create relationships as part of the add-on process, but I, we just stay away from it. It's, uh, yeah, it, it, you bring up an interesting point, Stephen. Is that that like again? I maybe I'm limited in what we in what I've seen, but like a timer add-on, it does come in with sample data. You could delete that fee, that table right away because it's just a sample. It's meant to show you how it's working um, before you configure it to your your particular fields. Um, I can't, you know, I haven't run into a situation yet. I haven't brainstormed a use case yet where I would want to tie the data, the, the, the table that comes in from the add-on with mine. There, there is a notes example that I'm going to do here in a bit that's going to tie to a specific table. But to me, add-ons are kind of like, they sit, I don't know, I, maybe I'm... I, I think it's, I, I, I mean, well, everybody wants to create, wants to create relationships to get things to hook to other things. That's what we've always done. And they may be able to give us a way to do that in a way that is effective, but what's there, I don't believe is. And um, I don't, it's just not gonna do, and Steve, you, you, you mentioned not exactly in the same detail or not with the exact examples, but how is it gonna know how I create relationships? Right. And it can do things like keys, but there's a lot of other things that go into how you create relationships. And I, right. I frankly just think that the tools that we have now um, allow us to do a lot of stuff without having to create relationships. And so that's where we're focusing is not trying to create relationships to existing schema, but develop things that are standalone and can be configured to use data from, from tables that are inside the system, but um, aren't connected to it in a hard way with a relationship because I just think you're going to have a lot of problems and Jeremy, I think is going to demo some of those problems. So we should maybe wait till we get there, but. Okay. Anyway. Real question, real quick question on what yeah. we were just talking about the deletion. Yeah. That's by that's by ID under the hood, right? It survives renaming things. The, the, it, yes, 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 yes. It's yes. by some secret magic, some secret thing they've tied them all together with that is not exposed in any of the XMLs that come out. So again, another reason why the namespacing thing is helpful. Um, if they don't give us that tool, um, maybe we can do something with FM Perception or something that will group things by a namespace, um, something like that. But um, that's the best we have. And it does delete everything that was brought in. So there's some secret key that's in there. So we, even if you uh, rename the stuff that's brought mm -hmm. in, it'll still find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I would... Yeah. I'm curious, Todd, uh, how does C code calendar work without creating relationships to the, the data that's in the system? I don't, well, is John still, I, is John here? And I'm going to show that here too, the way that they, he just set performs up. fine. There, there he is. Yeah, yeah. It's just performing fine. You know, these relationships anyways are too slow. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't, you, know, you really don't need relationships. Um, it's, it's obviously right. the, the simple default thing that we've all used forever, but there's lots of great ways to get data with, and especially if you're doing something with, if it's a JavaScript based application, which you're doing, all you need is JSON and how you come by that JSON is, doesn't matter. Right. 
Um, so that's how it does. That's the basics of it. Overall, I wouldn't make an add-on that adds a third of your system to your third your system. I would, to me, add-ons are small, like discrete. They have a closed scope. They have a very specific scope and they're, they're meant for that one piece of functionality, whether it's a star rating system, a toggle, a timer, something small. You could have 50 add-ons dispersed throughout your app. So when you delete one or more of them, you're not like wrecking your entire system. Um, so, all right, Jeremy, so yeah. One more question about installation and deletion. This is Alan Poole. Um, if you have, suppose you have a simple UI widget that you might install in more than one place in an app, like let's say a currency converter, and let's say you've got a data table there that it refreshes, uh, but it stores the ratios yeah. locally for offline use. Um, and you install it on three or five different layouts. Are you installing that same table over and over again each time you install it? No, no. I'll, I'll explain yeah. uh, that okay. install process that I showed in the video. Remember, it, it installs the tables that are part of the package. Once we have it installed, we drag it over, and it it is just an instance of that in, add-on. And every single one of those add-ons throughout your system are going to use the same tables and the same scripts. Same custom functions that are part of the package. And the reason that's a thing is because the first version of add-ons that we got in 18 or 17, whenever they came, actually did duplicate everything every time you installed them. And it was, a, it was, it was one of the first things that we, that we had to face and deal with and get fixed when we were setting about how to do this stuff. So thankfully, that's no longer the case. Great, thanks. It's a very useful, it could be a preferences. You could install a preferences add-on and use throughout the system, so... All right, so this is the fun one to me, configuration. So an add-on is supposed to be, you know, it's, it's some, some functionality like a toggle or a calendar or something that is supposed to somehow tie into your system. Sometimes add-ons do that. Sometimes they tie into your system. They need to be uh, configured to fit into your fields, into your tables, and maybe certain layouts. Some, some add-ons do not. Um, Big Tom put together a latency add-on. It's just a web viewer that measures my latency, I guess, for some reason. So that's just a simple one, one object thing um, that, that uh, is, it doesn't need any configuration. But for those that do um, need configurations, uh, need to be able to hook into the, the fields and the, the layouts and tables in the app, a developer needs to consider how to get this how to make this work. Our goal, to, to me, a goal with these add-ons is to get them as close to low to no code as possible so that a user doesn't have to do a whole lot of setup or has to, doesn't have to go into scripts and change field names and, and update stuff like that. You know, um, uh, our barcode creator, people ask about that all the time. Where do I hook this script up? What script do I hook up? How do I hook it up to my field, right? So we answer those questions. But uh, a, an add-on should remove a lot of that and make it as simple as possible. So some considerations for those, for those, um, those uh, add-ons that need configuration is how to hook up the tables and fields, how to hook them up to the particular place that you dragged them. If you dragged a timer onto 10 different layouts with 10 different contexts, how do you configure each one to work with the underlying uh, fields of that context? If it's a dashboard layout, like the Kanban board, how do you hook it up to layouts to get the data from? And, you know, very, very basically, I guess, very less important, but how to style it, how to make it fit, if possible, into your theme and your colors. So these considerations are part of what a developer needs to think about. And I picked three here that show a, a kind of an interesting range of, of ways to do this. Ronnie Rios at Claris put together this add-on. It's a button bar. It's that toggle thing that I showed. It's just three buttons, three buttons and a button bar, three segments. And the first one there on the left uh, is the gear and it's always hidden. And inside of its uh, button bar setup calculation dialog, this is where we would configure. You can see the first line is commented out and it says configure add on here. We can see that when we <laughs> click on that segment. So he's got a, J a JSON set element function here that uh, looks like it does some work to get the field name and gets 
you can even, uh, in this case, label on and label off there at the bottom there. You can um, s s state what you want it to say, what you want the field to say, or the, I'm sorry, the, the button bar to say when um, it's on or off. This is actually super clever. Yeah. Um, uh, because you can get the contents of a, of a uh, you can get the, you can get the, the contents of a label, right? You can get, um, you can get that, that value. So this is actually a super, I mean, just a button bar with a gear as like a, as a convention that doesn't show in browse mode, but you could actually use code to read the result out of. It's actually quite clever. Um, so, but in this case, somebody's going into a calc dialog to do that kind of config. And, you know, for developers who've been doing, working in, uh, in FileMaker for a while, this isn't a problem. Like, especially once you understand the, the JSON functions, you can imagine lots of ways to build config, whether it's in something like a layout object or in a script step that's loading up part of the web viewer or, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of ways that you could do this without having to build any kind of a UI for like, you know, teaching somebody how to use this thing. Um, and that works, I think, pretty well for people who are somewhat advanced um, or at least beyond the beginner stage and are, and are comfortable with calc dialogues and script steps. Um, and it's also really easy, which is nice. So I quite like this. This is very clever. Although I must say it, it uses one of the most confusing parts of FileMaker is the field name. Do I put in the field name here? Do I put it? I, I, I struggle with that for a minute, although he is trying to be very clear. It's just hard yeah, to read. Get field name. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could just hard code the name, but yeah, you're right. It would be, it would be better to do that. So this is a basic configuration and it works for this app. It's beautiful once it's running and I don't even have to look at the scripts. The scripts are using this calculation to grab the, the JSON object out of. I don't know what's happening. It doesn't matter to me um, because this, this is the only place I configure it. Um, Dayback does something very cool too. It's got a, John, don't, don't uh, yell at me if I get this wrong, but <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a, uh, a, a settings area where you go in and you pick the layout in that calendar info tab. I didn't get a snapshot of that. You pick the layout from which your events will come. And then this field mapping tab um, looks at all of the fields on that layout and it allows you to choose which ones you want to be the ID, the primary key, the start date and end date and so forth. You're awesome, dude. <laughs> well, it looks, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, it's because this is a product, right? You put a lot of time into making this simple and, yeah. and clean and, and very, it, it looks easy. Any, any developer, any person could get in here um, to, to update it. I don't know, John, if there's a way to, does this get hidden when it's not a full access user? Is this um, only yep. for? Yeah, there's a permissions layer and only the devs can get in here. Okay. So that's really useful. Um, and here's the in-product version of a configurator. This is for the Kanban board where, um, I, I grabbed the wrong picture here, but you're basically, you're in the required tab up at the top. I, I should show that quick. You're grabbing a layout that you want this data come from, similar to what Dayback Calendar is doing. And then after you have got the layout that contains all of the fields, that all of these fields have to be on that layout for this to work, you can now choose which fields represent which parts of the, of the add-on. And you know, like that label field right here, the start date is gonna get put at the top of the card to show, you know, that's what I wanna put in the label section of the Kanban board. So this is a, a configuration and um, is that clear? Should I uh, break into FileMaker exactly and show this specifically? Um, it's not that, I'll just do that because now I feel like I should have uh, done that at the beginning. Uh, just create a blank layout, something, something. Uh, I'm not gonna, well, I'm gonna need some fields, but the Kanban board, I'm just, just gonna the, You can just use the sample data to show yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna bring in the, the, the Kanban board, install that. There it goes. So this whole package, a bunch of um, uh, two tables came over like, I, like I've shown. The scripts, all these scripts came over. In our case, it's we've got it set in public and private folders. I, I'm not gonna get into specifics on this one right now. I've 
got a lot, a lot of blog posts on my site about how all of these work, but that's not necessary for today. So when I go into layout mode, it's already set up for the, the display. And because my layout isn't big enough, I didn't see, there we go. So our configurator allows us to uh, first choose the table from which these data fields come. If I change the layout, the source layout, then I'm getting, well, I'm getting no fields because that, that layout- That table doesn't have anything in it. Yeah. And specifically the layout, right? Because the yeah. table could have the fields, but if they're not on the layout, we're not gonna be able to access them. So I choose the Kanban sample data, and then I say, I want you to you know, hook up the primary key to this area. I'm gonna put the name here, and I'm gonna just change it up a little bit. Um, let's see, this is the, the, st the lane placement, the status, the sort. And I'm just gonna go in here and put, um, assigned to on the top. So right now the assigned to is in this nice little circle, but when I reconfigure it, now it looks like this and the assigned to is, is not coming up, um, but now we've got a different configuration. So we're allowing you uh, users to use the configuration to, uh, to, uh, to um, set, set how they want for this particular add-on. All right. So, um, so obviously, you know, the more complex the app is, the more configuration, it, the more configuration it's going to require. Um, we also had for these particular ones, we had to go uh, much farther than I think a lot of people will need to go just because of, they had to be released for multiple, eventually for multiple languages and things like that. So all of this stuff is, is all done so that it can be translated. Um, but I think, you know, the, what Jeremy was alluding to in the beginning is important. Like, if this is a product you're building, you're probably going to want to get to configuration because the number of people who can, who can work their, who can work their way through some kind of a GUI to set up a calendar or whatever it is, is going to be far higher than the ones who are going to be able to do it via some kind of script or some hidden button or layout object off to the side. Right? So um, the goal for add-ons, if you're talking about products is to make it as simple as possible for somebody to, to get up and running. And sometimes people are going to use these on day one, their first day of FileMaker, they're going to drag in a Kanban board. So you can't really expect folks like that to be able to modify scripts to be able to change their configuration. You got to give them something else. And that was, that was what we were going for there. However, if you're building them for your own internal development team, you don't need to go that far do it, you know, to put the JSON in the field, these, wherever you, how the mapping works, you know, the, the field names for each, each thing you need to bind to or whatever, do it that way. It doesn't matter. I mean, these are, as long as you're able to somehow make the connection to the code so that the, the code knows what to do to get the data, that's fine. Um, so it's, so configurators are just sort of like, they're, you know, if you're making a product, you want them. If you're making it for your dev team, you may not need to go that far. I, and, and the other thing is, they can be built with, uh, they, the ones we saw there, the configurators were built with JavaScript. Doesn't, did you have the one from, doesn't, who was it who had one that made a nice configurator with FileMaker stuff only? Was it Fabrice? It was, I didn't get yeah. a copy of it. Right. I didn't get, yeah, but he's got, on his, on his page, he's got videos that shows, he just has a, oh, in fact, you do too, Todd, with the, um, the picker. Um, oh, that's right, yeah. So yeah. the configurator, so, the, what may be missing is like what's going on there is that we're using various FileMaker functions and the new execute data API to gather metadata about the solution so that we can tell all the layouts, the tables, the fields, and we can tell whether they're number fields versus text fields versus container fields. So we can guide somebody through the process of picking what they want to do. So for example, in our GoDraw add-on, you wouldn't want to be able to put a text field if you want to be sending an image into the into the app. So those kinds of things are what, what we're doing to pull that up. Um, but you can build that UI in anything you want. And again, because the add-on is going to bring in everything, like this is this picker, this is all FileMaker, this configurator. There's nothing, there's no JavaScript in this at all. And uh, and the configurator is just, a, just another layout that comes in and it's got the things on I want to be able to pick from and that's how we do it. Um, any so questions on configurators or what we're doing here or why or all makes perfect sense? <laughs> it, 
it's something to consider. And as you start to build add-ons, I think you're going to find you have questions. How about, like how about problems? Anybody recognize any problems? Issues? How are you? What, 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 what happens if you configure your, your date start field um, in a calendar to be the right date field, but then you change the name of the date field? What do you think is going to happen? It's going to break. I'll just tell you. Because <laughs> we're, storing, we're storing the configuration as text, right? We're not, we're not binding to references because there's not a way for us to do that yet. Does that make sense? Am I... I'm not yeah. our, wow. In our case, for sure. In Ronnie Rios's case, that's not going to happen, right? Yeah, like because he's using get field, which is actually, which is one of the reasons why um, that's how I wanted to do it originally. But um, you know, when the when the mandate came down that this has to be usable on day one of somebody's user experience, asking them to figure out what get field is 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 a bit tough, or get field name or or whatever is a bit tough. So, um, but yeah, if you can do a configuration where you can reference fields with like get field name, for example, you're better off. Um, but you can't really do that in a GUI. So it's a trade off there. Now, what we've done is what we did is like when the config, when the config, which is just basically a, a set of JSON field mappings, it stores it in a field. And when the, when the add ons getting loaded, it just checks it. And if it doesn't line up, if it's missing fields, it'll just throw the configurator again and say somebody broke something and it's be outlined in red kind of thing. So that's, these are kind of, again, sort of more of the considerations you have to think about when you're going to be trying to ship something. The other reason I'm bringing that up is that, is that um, Claris is, has always had the intent, uh, or at least since we started this, this whole project, to make, a, to make configuration be something that happens in layout mode to be able so instead of you having to build a configurator that they would be able to expose something that you could hook into to do that. And then we hopefully would get field references instead of field names. So this is a situation which I hope will improve in the future. Um, but if you're thinking about building products uh, that are add-ons, you got to think about those kinds of things. Yeah, I have a question about that because uh, we're, we're thinking about how complicated can you get? You were just emphasizing simplicity, but could you, could we add a POS? Could we add yeah. an accounting module? Could we add a sure. CRM? Sure. Is that, is that within the realm of possibility to do that? Yeah, I've thought about that. So like, for example, our LedgerLink app would work great as an add-on. You could drag the whole thing in and it would just work. Um, and that's pretty interesting. Um, but I, I, the, the challenge to me there is, the difference between something like a calendar, which is GUI, and something like the dates in your calendar and the data that you're exposing, which isn't. So if you're going to bring in a whole accounting system, that accounting system has data or something like that, a POS, for example. And now you've got all these tables and things that are part of that add-on. That's data. So it's, you know, an add-on today, I think, is best works best as something that you could throw out and be okay with, you know? Um, and I just don't know if I want to, you know, how would you, how would you update the POS once it's in there? Um, I think there just might be better ways to do large systems like that as separate files, for example, and hook them in using external file references and things like that. Um, but I think where that line gets drawn as to like how complex it is, I don't know. It's somewhere somewhere in the middle there between probably like, you know, a single table and a full CRM somewhere in there is a place where it gets silly to do. I don't know I what that question. place is. So you think it's worth exploring and it's not like a don't go there kind of thing. It's no, like I don't, I think it's worth exploring. Absolutely. I think you'll run into some issues you didn't expect, but it might turn out to be useful in some cases. Yeah. Um, okay. Is it possible to, I don't want to say daisy chain, but connect add-ons together you have a calendar and yeah. you have a, a kanban board that depends yeah. on that calendar so if you uninstall one you break everything downstream of it correct so it, not so much in that particular case but you're on to something so in in the case of let's say kanban and calendar which both might be displaying 
say tasks or events or things that have dates and statuses, right? So in that case, what you would do is you would, um, you bring in the calendar, you say, and then you, you look at that sample data table and then you say, you know what, I'm gonna make this mine. And so maybe you copy, you just duplicate it. So now you've got your own event table. And now you hook that event table up to the calendar UI using the configurator and you hook that event table up to the Kanban board using that configurator and that's your event table now bound, bound to those two add-ons. If you delete the add-ons, your event table is not going anywhere. Um, or you could also just choose to not delete the, the, the record data when you uninstall it. Now, there might be situations where you're depending on functionality in two add-ons, especially if it's computational. Um, and we don't really have any good way of managing dependencies. Like there's no like, hey, check, is this thing there? Uh, you know, um, anything like that uh, before you go and install it. So, but the only thing I can say is if you do have things where you, you, know, you want an add-on that might, that might expose some functionality to other things in your system, like computationally, let's say, or maybe even like, um, yeah, let's just take barcode generation for something simple. You might want to reference those elements in the add-on by name as opposed to by hard-coded script call or something like that so that when you delete it, it's not going to break something. It's not going to just leave you with an, a broken script reference. Um, you'll be able to put it back in and have it reconnect because it's referenced by name. So it's this idea of using indirection between modules. Use indirection as opposed to hard links. You're going to hear uh, that's what we're doing a lot of is whether we're you know, picking fields to then go do finds on or, 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 um, or gather data from or we're, we're, or we're using perform script by name to call something else in another add-on. We're doing that via indirection so we don't break things when we remove them. So if, if, I, I, uninstall the, if I uninstall the, the calendar, um, I can reinstall it with an updated version. Yeah. And the, nothing would break that I maybe had referenced by name in that add-on piece. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's a good that's a good point because it currently there's no there's no way to like update an add-on in place. So the updating mechanism that's dependent. I mean, if your add-on is nothing but JavaScript, you've got other ways to update it. But if your add-on has a significant amount of FileMaker code in it, then there's no updating currently. It's certainly on the part of the plan, but there's no updating. So the update procedure, quote unquote, is to delete and reinstall. <laughs> <laughs> so not great, um, obviously, but that's what we have. And so you want to think about making soft references or indirect references to things between, between these add-ons as opposed to hard references like relationships and, and script calls that are reference things by their reference. Hope that, does that answer question, Lynn? Does that help? I've... Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think a, a really good example of this, not to toot our own horns, but is the add-ons that are in product. There is nothing direct about any of those. Um, the only thing that is direct is the lay, the, is go to layout, uh, go to the configurator layout, basically. Everything else is, is in direction, referenced by name, actually pulling from the JSON object. So, and I've written a lot of blog posts about how those in product add-ons work. So um, if you really want to understand how uh, an approach to being indirect, that's a good resource okay. to look at. One a quick time check. Are we done in, in 17 minutes. minutes? Yep. So we should get through, cause we definitely want to get to considerations a little bit. <laughs> okay. So um, let's see if we can do the, do one of these here or, or walk through this part here. So right now to create an add-on, it's a manual process. You have to go through certain steps, which I'll walk through here. Uh, there is no good way to do it. I think they're exploring some sort of template idea, something, but it's, it's pr pretty manual at the moment. And again, I've written about it. Other people have written about it as well. So I will go through it. So we start off with an uh, uh, add-on file. I always recommend <clears throat> that when you go to create a new file, create, create an add-on, you just start with a new file. That's important because a new, when you generate a new file, you get unique ID for that file and you get a unique ID for all of the objects that will be part of that file, uh, script, scripts, layouts, um, 
objects on the on the layout and so forth. And that's important because we ran into uh, bugs where um, where uh, you would reference the wrong. If I built the Kanban and the calendar in the same template file, and I just deleted. Um, stuff and I, I reconfigured some of the scripts to be the Kanban instead of calendar, which I did at the beginning, then I, my, if I installed them both in the same app, the Kanban might reference the, the calendar scripting because- Yeah, that's making me idea. second guess my copy and paste because there's definitely UUI, UUID collisions that, have ha that can happen. There, um, yeah, so, so you, wanna, you wanna make sure you don't have the same UUIDs. There is a way to override this if you decide, like we have a template file that we create all of our add-ons because it's got all the scripting framework and so, so forth. When we go to actually run the script step, we add a, we uh, toggle on a feature, uh, uh, an option and it works. But you know, it's, it's a good idea to, I think, to start with a new file. Your file structure um, can contain all of the layouts, tables, fields, custom fun objects, custom functions, custom menus, and uh, themes that you want. You set it up to be how you want because everything that I list here with the exception of one, uh, a few layouts is going to come over and be part of the, um, of the package. So you wanna take care and how, I'll show you one in a minute here, but you wanna take care and just design it. You wanna have all your layout, layouts in certain folders, scripts in certain folders. As you saw my Kanban one, I, I, I keep forgetting this, but some, there's some trick to getting everything to collapse and then leaving it collapsed every time you open it. And I noticed the Kanban one, everything comes, every, every um, script folder is open. So I should have, uh, I think I should have figured out that trick to work, but you set up your file as you want. I'll show you that in a minute. Then you, you start to design. So here's the star rating app that Ronnie put together. This is his file that he created it in. It's just called star rating. It's just got um, one, one layout, one object that we see here, and there's one script in this file. I didn't take a snapshot of the whole thing. But what's important for the add-on process is you create one layout per localization you want. You put everything on each of the layouts that you want to be for each of the localization. I'll tell you what, it mean, what that means in a minute. And then all of that will be packaged up. You can see in the picture there, the name of the layout is vital for the, the uh, process to work correctly. This is the only layout here that will not be part of, of the app of the, of the add-on package. It won't be part of it. Um, yeah, it won't be part of it. And then the, the, pre, the suffix at the end, en represents English. That's the localization that tells FileMaker and the system settings, which, uh, which to use. So if I had this one for English and I had one for French, then this would be localized for those two languages. Um, so there we got that. Now, Notice this layout setup has no table attached. Ronnie deleted the table out of here. I know FileMaker always creates a table. He didn't need a table because there was no point in having data for this. So he just deleted it and that's perfectly fine. And that's, that's okay. I said that the, this layout will not come over, but if you do have a table underneath it as its context, that will come over. That will be part of the package. And that's how we created the add-ons. We have a H, uh, I forget, it's just called timer is the, is the name of the table and it holds the HTML code or the, the JavaScript code for the add-on. Um, and that's, that's, that would be under this context here. So, so sp specific layouts, then on that layout, you put all of the objects that you want to. Um, I thought I had pictures of this. Um, so you take that layout and you, you, Everything that you want to uh, be part of the package, as far as objects, you put onto that layout and you group them together. And and the that whatever you group together is going to be the thing that gets dragged on from from the from the left. And there's only one thing. You yep. only get to have one thing per add-on, which is a pretty severe limitation. But that's where we're at today. So everything is grouped together. I'm surprised silly that I don't have pictures. Um, in, in Dayback's case, which is a pretty cool idea, 
John, you don't have anything on this particular layout. I don't even know if you created this layout because you didn't have anything that you needed to drag over. Is that right, John? Yeah, we just put a little dialogue there in case somebody does drag it over to say, hey, you've successfully installed, go to this layout to see the calendar. Okay, so yeah. you group the items together on this layout. So this, um, this star thing here, this right here is grouped together. It's a button bar, it's grouped together. This button that he has up here is not part of the group. This will not be part of the package. And this is really useful because you're, you're able to put some you know, dev buttons up here and test buttons and so forth. And you're able to put a script step, a button that runs the script step to create the add-on. You're able to put it in the same file, but that won't be part of the, the work. This, the silly thing is this script that, that, well, he was clever. If this were an actual script, it would come over. And so it's like a dev only script. But what he did is he set it up to be just a script step to run the, the, the command. So that developer only script doesn't get brought over. That was a clever idea. So you group the items together and there's a weird weirdness about it that you can't group just one object. You can't put yeah. a group around one object. So something else has to be part of the object. At least initially you can create the group and then delete the other object there you go. and the group will stay, but you can't create a group of one object. Now we'll get to this, but once you've got this group, well, I'm not gonna even talk about that. So we, we group the items together. Here, I actually have an example of that. This is the, the um, this is actually a photo gallery add-on that I put together. Um, this, you can see the group there. It contains a bunch of buttons. It contains a configurator button in the top right and some, some navigation buttons. It contains a web viewer and it's got, it's, it's all grouped together. So all of that will be brought over into uh, packaged up. Now, if you intend to have your add-on be used multiple times throughout the file, it should have uh, a way to um, generate a, U a unique UUID. So every time you drag an add-on eventually from FileMaker, from the add-ons panel into FileMaker, if you have a, a certain uh, placeholder text there, which you can see kind of in the top there, it'll be, a, a new UUID will be regenerated a UUID will be regenerated for each instance. So if I drag it over from the panel a hundred times, all hundred of those instances are gonna have separate UUIDs and thus my scripting can work with the individual um, I, UUID that I'm, uh, add-on that I'm interested in. This is probably the most technically uh, point here I want to uh, save you from this, but, th but we have written a, a lot about this. So I'll just uh, kind of defer to that for the moment. But this uh, stuff in brackets will be uh, replaced with a UUID and then all of the scripts, I thought I had a picture of that. All of the scripts that are attached to these buttons have that UUID as a uh, parameter so that this button knows if there were seven uh, photo galleries on the tape on the layout, this button previous would know to um, show the previous images in this add-on. So they're tied together by this UUID. So we're using, uh, using get layout object attributes and things like that to, to um, or, Oh, there it is. Okay, so there's the script. Yeah. There's the script that has the same text in it that gets replaced by the, uh, by the generation, pro by the drag on process. So in the, in the case of like the JavaScript stuff, obviously you want a button, your FileMaker button to do something to that JavaScript add-on. That, that web viewer has to have a, um, you want to be able to know you're hitting that web viewer. So the web viewer will include in its name that same tag. And that way when it's dragged on, it will be replaced. So this is exactly the way to think about this is when you're dragging this as a package of XML, and whatever's in that XML, if it contains that string, that, that, that funky FMXML add-on UUID string, that will get replaced. And it will be replaced in that single drag-on instance. Every place in that XML package that's coming on and dropping will be replaced with the same add-on. So different parts of the code can look and it can know that I need to target this web viewer or that button or, or that configuration or 
that kind of here's thing. Here's the here's Ronnie's uh, star rating thing that I showed earlier. Each button is named with a uh, with that UUID. So you could have perfect ten different toggles attached to ten different fields, and it knows which one. If you click that, it'll send this i this ID to the script, and the script will handle it the right way. So it's the object names that get updated it's, in the dragon. Exactly. Not just object names. Um, yeah. It's anywhere. Yes, it's any Close. any layout calculation. Yeah. So script parameters, conditional formatting, data hides, all that stuff. Anything that's in the lay, anything that you can imagine pasting onto a layout. Imagine that as XML, and imagine that if that tags in there, it'll be replaced. Thanks. Yeah. This this doesn't work in the scripts. If you have this, if you're passing this placeholder text to another script via a script, it doesn't work. You have to pass it through a layout object. Yeah, some kind of layout calculation or layout object. Um, yeah. Right. Um, okay. I, I have a question. If, mm -hmm. if you have multiple instances of an add-on, do you have to configure each one of them separately? Yes. Sure, because you might want to tie it to different you know, I, I want, I want Here, this calendar to use that field, this database. I want this calendar to use a different database uh, table, or I might want to do different filtering on different, different calendars or charts would be another one. You might want various charts on your, on your one layout and you want to configure them to, to use different things or to appear or to have different styles. Yep. And if they're on different layouts, say you want the same picker on 20 different layouts. You have to configure it 20 to Well, actually you don't, you can copy and paste it and it will work that way. And um, so that is one way. Um, this is kind of, so the, this whole configuration thing, I should, well, let me back up. I should say the way that the add-ons that are shipping, that's how they work. People can do configuration in any number of different ways. So however they're doing that configuration would affect this answer. But in our case, the configurations are stored in the data table that comes in. And so therefore, if you, um, if you drag in the calendar, configure it, and then take that calendar, copy it, and paste it on another label, it will have the same configuration because it has the same add-on UUID. Because if you copy it and then paste it on another layout, you haven't gone through the drag process. So the add-on UUID that replacement tag is going to be the same. So it's going to share the same config in that case. But that's important. The, the, the underlying thing there is that add-on UUID is not changing. If you so just do are, copy and paste. These are two separate configurations, two separate instances, because I dragged them over twice. They have different IDs and they're used. So that's, that's definitely something to play with and explore as you um, do yours. I think we're All right. We're, we're about out of time, unfortunately. Um, well, let me just do one more thing then. So um, the creation of these is a simple um, script step, save a copy as add-on package. I think I was using the wrong script step. Yeah. That's a script step that we have. It can be run from a button and we give it the parameters that it's asking for. That replace UUIDs will go through every object in the package and, and generate a new UUID so we don't get any of that conflict if you're using the same file for many different um, add-ons. And once you have installed that add-on or once you've run this, it'll open up this folder here and it'll show you, hey, I installed the latency add-on or whatever add-on you put together. And as of 19.1.2, it'll also generate this .fm add-on file, okay? So that is, I'm going to, there, we, I have talked a lot about, there, there's, there's a whole section in here about relationships. I'm going to go ahead. We have written about it. If, uh, if I can skip over it here, um, but we've written about how to, how to work this. Um, so you can explore that if, if you're interested in, in coming up with relationships, it's just, you have to name things certain ways. You have to, um, you have to group things certain ways in order for this to work. Don't get your hopes up here on, yeah, the, on the relationship stuff. It's I actually still you, broken because would, it's going yeah. to, yeah. anyway, yeah. Let's, I would encourage you to play with it if you're interested, but don't get your hopes up. All yeah. right. 
So we talked a little bit about this already, and uh, I would love, I know we, we got to stop. I'd love for Stephen and um, Steve <laughs> to, to uh, you know, pipe up as well. But as Todd said, there is no good updating process at the moment. Maybe there is a plan that would be great. The best way to do it is to uninstall it, reinstall it, and configure if you get a new version from the developer. You know, there, there's still a lot surrounding this, but, we're, but we've only got 1.0 versions of add-ons anyway. So we still have a little bit of time to figure out, Claris has a little bit of time to figure out how are we gonna update these and then teach us that process. Jeremy, um, have, you, have you tried to uh, update where you leave the data behind on uninstall and then reinstall and does it use the tables that are already there? It will not, it will not use the tables. Thank you. It'll bring in new tables. Yeah. Um, it will, FileMaker said, Claire says it's okay. Well, I'm not going to even in, get into that. Never mind. All right. So security, there's definitely some talk and, and very much uh, it does need to be discussed about security. We have to consider the add-ons we use in our files. Stephen Blackwell and um, the other Steve, <laughs> they, they did a uh, blog post about, or not a blog post. They did a, a white paper about this and they bring up a lot of good points. Uh, you have to figure out, you know, you have to look at every add-on, consider the source, consider the, the who, who made it. Um, you have to think about malicious scripts or script steps. I'm not sure if corruption can come over. I haven't explored that. Um, that's an interesting idea if a layout object is corrupted. Actually, there is an example of that in uh, Ronnie Rios' uh, um, toggle, active toggle. Oh, One yeah. of the uh, off buttons is not uh, web viewer safe, web com web direct safe, the SVG is corrupted or something. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. So, so it does come out, right? It does, it, uh, corruption is part of the package, apparently, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, so the biggest thing is it, malicious scripts. Uh, Mr. Blackwell, do you wanna speak to this briefly, very briefly? Yes, there, this is a very real concern. We are working on it. Uh, there are three of us that are working on it uh, very diligently, and as soon as we have more updated information, including possible ways to ameliorate or to identify the problem, um, we will obviously be reporting to the committee or uh, back to the community. For okay. now, be sure, be sure of the source and always try this out initially on a copy of your production file, uh, never on the only version of it that you have. Yeah, for sure. I, I would recommend if you don't know the developer, put it into an empty file first, maybe do an analysis on it and look for things like truncate table or, uh, or func or base elements function calls that execute SQL to drop table. I mean, you gotta, you know, you want to, if you don't know where the source is, you should, you should be doing that. You should be looking at the code that's coming in before you put it in anything you care about. Also, for sure. Josh, especially if Josh Armand makes an add-on, I would be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah, did you have something on that? I thought I, I was just to say also look for uh, like curl commands and understand yeah. where they're sending information to. Yeah, exactly. Cause they could be spying on you. I don't know. I, it would be awesome if uh, FM perception and base elements and, and those, those tools help me know which scripts to, I mean, I know which script steps, but, but uh, could delete tables, but it'd be nice if, if they called them out in some way, now that we have this possibility of injecting code. So um, I think I've asked Dave to do that, to point out the, the, especially in FM perception, point out the dangerous ones. All right, so um, source and value, just wanna make one more mention. There is a um, add-ons part in the my, my marketplace where um, at least right now, partners are allowed to submit, um, submit uh, add-ons and it looks like uh, Fabrice from One More Thing has got some stuff in there and um, so forth. So look at those, see how they're, especially the configuration, I'm really interested in that. And um, I'm excited to see what people do with these add-ons. So your homework is to create an add-on and report back <laughs> next month, okay? Yeah, there you go. All right, please check out our site. We have a lot of information about add-ons, specifically how to create them, how to work with them, as well as 
the specific in product add-ons and uh, that'll be enough. There yeah. You I, I just to call that out. Um, there's, there's a lot here to cover and uh, Jeremy's done a great job of documenting everything we know about, about the process um, into various uh, blog posts and pages on our site about how to do it. And it, it's extensive. There's a lot of little things that we've learned putting this together. And so I encourage you to check that out. I know that there are various, there are people who are wondering why all this documentation is only on Geist Interactive site, not on Clarissa's site. And I think that's a good, good feedback and you should give it to them. Um, you know, uh, we asked them to put it up and they wouldn't. So we asked them, could we put it up? And uh, so that's where we're at. That's where we're at. But I, it clearly needs to move there. And I think it will once, once some of this stuff that is still pretty early on gets ironed out, the documentation will be there. But as of right now, um, and literally everything we know is there. We didn't hold anything back. It's all there. So if you really want to learn about all the, the little bits and pieces, um, that's, that's, that's the best reference that there is on it. So. Definitely check that out. Todd Claris just sent me an email asking me if we could give them some of our stuff for their documentation. Well, there you go. Beautiful. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all for, I'm sure you're overwhelmed about add-ons. So feel free to reach out and ask questions. Um, be glad to answer them. Thank you both. Thanks. Yeah, great. Um, Jeremy, Todd, thank, thank you both very much. That was very educational. Um, and very well presented. I, I appreciate it a lot. I, I'm sure everyone here got a lot out of that. Uh, so thank you again. Um, so I'm just going to uh, do um, some quick announcements real quick before we get started with our next presentation. I'm, I'm going to keep this very short. Um, uh, if you're new to FMDISC, if this is your first time here, please let me know. Um, I'll make sure you're added to the meeting announcement list and the group uh, discussion list, uh, which is a, a great uh, discussion list to be a part of. Um, the presentations are being recorded. They're gonna be made available online through our YouTube channel, our FMDISC YouTube channel. Uh, honestly, if you just uh, go on YouTube and just search for FMDISC, uh, it'll come right up. All the individual videos come up and then also the channel comes up. Uh, so you can see them all aggregated in one place. Uh, if you've got a topic that you'd like to suggest or present to the group, uh, we love having new speakers. Uh, we encourage people to, to uh, give this a try. Um, and uh, if you've always been hesitant before because you didn't want to stand in front of a bunch of real life people, well, now you have the chance to do it in a, a little bit more uh, comfortable setting. So uh, um, please consider if there's anything that you'd like to share in the future. Um, a uh, couple last things. First of all, please contribute to Brisi for many, 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 many years, for decades, actually. I think they were our home for FMDISC uh, in-person meetings and may again be for the occasional meeting in the future. Uh, and uh, they're an excellent charity. You can see their URL there on the screen. It's just brisi.org. Um, uh, they do a lot of really good work in their community and are worthy of all the support that they can get uh, and they you can make donations uh, online to them so uh, it's uh, something I encourage you to do. Uh, last of all I'll just remind you all to keep yourself muted uh, during the presentation unless you have a question um, so that uh, background noise doesn't distract from the presentation and now I'm going to uh, introduce someone who I've done a slight disservice to um, uh, our, our next presenter uh, is actually Dr. Don Levan. I forgot to include his title. Um, and uh, I can only blame the fact that uh, I have not been in close contact with him for many years. I'm very happy to see him back here speaking to us. Um, for those of you who uh, have attended uh, DevCon in uh, uh, the past, uh, you might know that uh, Dr. Don Levan is a must-see speaker at, at DevCon, or, or, or was when he was doing that, and uh, um, you know, definitely someone who I always got a lot of great information from. So I'm really excited to have him here speaking today. And uh, with that, um, uh, Dr. Don Levan, if you will please uh, begin your presentation. Thank you so much, Bob. It's, uh, I gotta tell you guys, it is really nice to be back here. I 
um, was a FileMaker developer for 10 years. Actually, Todd taught the first training that I took in 2004, which was the six to seven FileMaker conversion training. And I was a FileMaker developer for 10 years. I taught, spoke at DevCon and taught some classes. And, and then a friend lured me away to do some cool stuff I'll tell you about. But I've missed this community. It's, uh, it's really nice being back. I happened to be on for DevCon this year and saw everybody. And a client from 10 years ago reached out to me and asked me to do a project. And so I partnered with Proof. And that's actually being deployed today. And that's a uh, FileMaker to SQL uh, data warehouse that we're building. So the way of getting started, let me ask you a question. Does this feel familiar? So this is the, uh, oh, and I should just say before I start, I, can't, I only have one monitor, so I won't be able to see who's talking. So feel free to ask questions at times, but just call out who it is, because I won't know, because I can't see, can't see on my screen who's talking. So this is the, uh, the time confidence curve, uh, first put out by Tim Brown and IDEO, later called the dip by Seth Godin. And what you have on the left side is, is confidence. So the vertical is how confident you are in what's going on. And the right is time. And Tim Brown and IDEO postulated that when you're in a project, this is what happens. You start out in the top left on a high, full of energy, full of excitement. And then the project continues. And at some point you hit bottom. You're dragging ass, you're on the floor, you don't know how you're gonna get out. And it's like rock climbing slowly, ever so slowly to get yourself out of it. And eventually you get out. So what I wanna to do today is tell you about two projects. And, and the one that went well and one that didn't and, and the difference between and what I kind of learned from doing both of them. And my hope in doing that is to share and hope there's something here that's helpful to you. By way of context, I want to just tell you a little bit about what I've been doing and uh, where I've been. So in 2015, a close friend uh, asked me if I would consider applying to Lithion at ADP. Um, ADP, most of you, or many of you have heard of. Uh, ADP started life as a payroll processing company in 1949. It's been around for 50 years. There's some statistic that says, if in the United States you work at some point in your life, there's a 90% chance you'll end up in an ADP database. And so ADP, after a long run being successful, started to realize that they were close to becoming Kodak. They, um, for each thing that they would build, they had a separate team in each geography a uh, geographic region that would rebuild the same thing because they weren't globally compliant. They had to build each thing. And that wasn't going to scale. It was fine until we, the web happened. But once web upstarts started to nip at their heels, they were really close to risking losing it all. And so they created a lab they called Lithion, which was a skunk works operation in New York City that was started as a completely standalone environment from ADP itself. And our mission was to run fast and break things. We were um, told to build a new platform and a new set of applications that um, would replace a lot of the ADP apps. And so I was hired as a solutions architect. And you can think about Lithion very much like FileMaker we were building a rapid application development platform using uh, React on the front end and uh, everything on the Amazon cloud and in Docker and like cutting edge, globally compliant from the beginning um, and, and ready to scale around the world. And so the idea was there was an application team, a platform team that was building, you can think of like FileMaker. So we were building a rapid application development platform with a drag and, drag and drop and configure uh, relationship interface, a drag and drop configure scripting interface, and a drag and drop configure UI interface with a bunch of other things. So I was hired to be a product manager there. 
initially in charge of the scripting interface, and then a year later, to my excitement, running the UI front end. And so I was responsible for all of the components you would drag onto the interface and the look and feel of it. Um, and uh, because we were, we were running fast and breaking things, the way this project started was using as much off the shelf as we could. So our UI, initial UI was built using Bootstrap CSS, was built using off the shelf component libraries that we could purchase. And the reason for that was we didn't have any clients yet. We needed something that was quick and easy to get up and um, able to get people running so that the application development teams, which were like you guys, like me previously, who were building apps on the platform could build those apps quickly and start to get them out to clients. So at Lithion, we had platform teams who were building the platform that the application developers were using, and we had application teams that were building new HR apps. And the idea was we would start out by building a small set of HR apps that would go out to a small set of clients, and then over a 10-year period, eventually those would replace all of the things around the world, and there would be 50 million people using these things. Um, so that was the plan. And I was there for about three years at the beginning, not quite the very beginning, but I came in when we were starting to get traction. So the user interface when I started was, was ugly, it was functional, but it was difficult to make it work right. Um, there were as many, you know, stupid Lithion hacks as there are stupid FileMaker hacks. And maybe it's not so much a problem now, but when I was doing FileMaker stuff, in order to get things to look the way you wanted, there were a lot of like tricks that you would do to get them to work right. Same thing at Lithion. And so when I took over as a UI, there were two projects that I did. Uh, many more, but two that I'm gonna tell you about. The first one was replacing the table Lego. We had a table component where you know, the developers would drag a table onto the interface and would configure it and would use it. And because we were doing HR data all the way through from employee onboarding to the management of that, to offboarding, to benefits, about two thirds of the interfaces had tables on it. The, and so what we needed to do was replace the underlying engine for the table of Lego and then also replace the UI because the engine was had a very specific uh, JSON medicine, uh, metadata configuration. Everything was metadata underneath this platform. And it was, we couldn't scale it. We couldn't do the things that the application developers were asking us to do. We were really constrained. So we needed to replace the engine. We also wanted to replace the UI because it was, it was hard and it wasn't great. And so we kicked off a project. And so at kickoff, we were like, yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to replace the engine. It's going to be so good. It's going to be a two-month project. We're going to be able to do this, and everything's going to be great. About a month and a half into the project, two of the engineers on my team, so I was a product manager, which means I was responsible for figuring out what the thing needed to do, partnering with a technical lead who was my partner, but we worked together, managing a team of engineers, um, in terms of what they do and what work they do. And I would write all the stories and direct that work. And then they would go off and do it. And we'd have stand-ups every day. We were in an agile shop. About a month and a half in, two of the engineers came to me and said, the architecture is wrong. We're going down the wrong road. This is going to be a problem. It's not going to give us what we wanted. And so we think we should rewrite it. So we had a big team discussion. It took us about a week and a half. We finally figured out what we were going to do. And we started going. So then about three months, we were close to rolling it. It looked like everything was going great. And we really wanted to roll out the styles. And I said, okay, we've got to do this. It's going to be a lot of pain anyway. Let's, let's roll them out at the same time because we can just replace the CS, CSS. It's going to be fine. And then about four months in, we had engine bugs and we had UI bugs. It was not a great situation. At five months, three months late, we finally rolled out the new table Lego. And we, it was okay, but as soon as users started using it, they started reporting both the UI bugs and engine bugs. At this point, we started having meetings with management 
with the burn down chart of the bugs or when we're going to get them done. And finally, about seven months, we finally finished and we wiped our brow and said, oh my God, we, we made it, we survived. And so I got to tell you, when I was growing up, my dad was a, a philosophy major and he would speak in aphorisms. And one of the things he'd like to say is that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So I guess I'm stronger. Thanks, Dad. It, it, you know, it's, it was one of those things. So I want to contrast this project to the Beacon Styling System. So the Beacon Styling System was a <clears throat> rewrite of the underlying CSS and the components um, that, we were, that we were serving. And like I said, we started out with open source components and off uh, an open source um, CSS framework and off the shelf components. But very quickly, it started to constrain us. Once we started to get real clients, we started to have some clients say to us, oh, your thing looks like it's in the, you know, in the 90s, it doesn't look nice. We started to have application developers say to us, we can't, we can't do the things we need to do. When we try to do them, they're bugs. We're constantly having to work around. The design team is creating designs that we can't implement. We need to create our own styling system. And so this is what this project looked like. We had a pre-kickoff. We had, came up with an idea. We kicked it off. We, we started to move forward. And then a year later, we delivered. And we delivered on time. We delivered with live clients. Um, it was a huge project, the biggest project I've ever, ever been involved with. It involved two teams of engineers, a team of designers, um, a three month beta period. I went to India for two weeks to work on site with one of the beta teams and one of my engineering teams there. We rolled out to live clients in production on time as scheduled and everything was great. And so the difference between these two projects, which were only separated by about a year is really striking. And I think part of what made this one different was the stakes were much, much higher. The sales team, was selling to live clients. The application teams were contracted to develop certain apps and deliver them on time. We had to go live. And so there was a lot of pressure. And so there was a lot of planning and thought that went into this project. And so I wanna, wanna talk about what we did. But as a segue before I get there, I wanna tell you about Alan Cooper. So those of you who've heard me speak at DevCon have heard, heard me talk about Alan Cooper. Those of you that have come to the design studios that I teach, have heard me talk about Alan Cooper. Alan Cooper wrote the book, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum and About Face. And he kicked off, his books kicked off the user experience field in a lot of ways, him and Donald Norman and a couple of others. Alan Cooper spoke at Agile 2008, the conference about Agile. And he was talking about the way that designers could work with engineers who were using an Agile uh, development process. And he noted that there are four stages of software creation. Two are agile and two are fragile. And so the four stages are the big idea, the design stage, the engineering, and the construction stage. And each of these stages ha involves, you know, different goals, requires different methods and tools, has different outcomes. And, and problems come if you confuse and, and don't respect the ordering of the stages. What happens often, and a big part of what I teach in the design studio is people go from big idea to construction. And there are real problems that happen with that. Another part of the problem is when you conflate design and engineering. And so the, the, the agile stages, are design and engineering. And the fragile stages are the big idea and construction. And I would say that he left out two stages out of his presentation, which are testing and, and the launch and planning the launch and delivering the launch. And so I wanna walk you through the project that we did and talk about what we did differently in, in, in thinking about these various stages. And, and as I do, I want to invite you to think about your projects. Think about what kind of curves 
they might have, whether you're experiencing a lot of pain or not so much. Think about if there's anything here that is useful for you and, and what, um, what you can learn from our mistakes and what maybe if there's anything here that is helpful to you. And I'd love to, when we're done, I'd love to ask you and hear about your projects and what, you know, what this triggers for you. So the big idea. It was very apparent to me that our, our UI was a problem, but it was a big, big deal to replace it. I knew it was going to be a six to 12 month project. I knew it was going to involve a lot of people. It was going to be very expensive. It was going to be hard to do. And um, it, it, it just, I didn't have the, I didn't have the power to get it done initially. And so it took from the inception of the idea to kick off about four or five months of, of sales, really. You know, part of what you have to do when you have a big project is you have to win over the key decision makers. You have to, um, you have to, yeah, you have to create an image of the difference between where you are now and what could be. And you have to create tension that's only resolved when you realize what could be. And so part of what we had to do was win over the key decision makers. So I started out by assessing all of the Legos that we had. And I submitted, uh, I conducted um, surveys and ratings with the application developers and the user experience team. And you can see that the Legos were, were rated, you know, mostly rough or acceptable. And our, but our mission was to be best in class. We were ADP. We needed to have a best in class application development and consumer grade, you know, user experience. But the current state of most of our, except our Legos were meh. Yeah, they were fine, but they were nothing special. Um, and, and, and developers would say things like, we can't build it the way the designers want to. There are always visual bugs. The, the engineers would say things like, the CSS is really hard to use. And we were at the point in Lithium's development when I started, there were about 75 people. By this time, a year and a half later, there were 200 of us, um, where our engineering teams were trying to shave off microseconds off the load. But our, our CSS was bloated and it was fragile and it was difficult. And so it was hard. And so, to, to sell that idea, we, you know, I had the good fortune that Lifion hired a director of design and I created a very good relationship with him. And then Chris, the director of design, hired my partner Camden, partner in crime in this case, who was hired to be a lead designer for the styling system. So that together the three of us sold the management on it. We did presentations to, um, First, all of the management team directly above us. Then we sold it to the executive team in our building. Then we had to sell it to all of the application development teams and the sales team and get everybody on board. And once we had a commitment that this was gonna happen, then we started designing. We started designing the product and we started designing the project. And so one of the key lessons here was to think of your project as a product. This was an internal product, but it was definitely a product. And thinking about it like a product really made a huge difference in how we, how we got there. The other thing that was really important in the design stage was declaring what we weren't going to do. The biggest mistake I made in the table Lego fiasco was saying, sure, we can roll out the CSS along with the, the new UI along with the engine, but that made it impossible to test and it made it brittle. And so it needed to be totally separate. And so what we did was we created a very specific statement that said, we are not going to do anything that will impact the current runtime experience when developers or application developers are using the legacy style sheet. We would not do anything that required the Lithium developer to have to choose to either make the pages look good in the legacy system are good when they use the new style sheet. And we weren't gonna introduce any new non-essential functionality. Now, this was a big deal and we had to 
fight for this and fight constantly throughout the project to keep this because we're basically saying for a year we're drawing in the sand we're not releasing you know new stuff that violates any of these rules and to do that we created we were using jira and we um created three epics in jira that very specifically called out you know anything that came up that was going to be technical debt that we had to deal with after we would put it in the technical debt and we scheduled it anything that came after that where there were property changes. You can think of FileMaker, the drag and drop configure, there were property changes. So anything that we needed to do a property change, we scheduled that to do after. And then we had, you know, is this a first tier styling defect? Is this a second tier styling defect? And is this new functionality? So we planned epics of what we were gonna do once we went live and anything new that came up, we put into one of those epics. We set really clear milestones. So over the course of the year, the first milestone was that the style sheet was created, that the baseline grid and typography was implemented by the end of Q1. The end of Q2, we were gonna have all the form layout and interaction controls implemented. The end of Q3, we had two product teams that had completed testing and that we were cleared for global adoption. In Q4, we were gonna have this in production released to all clients. And so we set those up. We declared them at the beginning. Then we started engineering and you can see that the design and the engineering overlap a little bit. And in fact, right from the very beginning, we had design and engineering working together. And that was one of the things I was most proud about was that we had a team of designers in New York, had a team of engineers in New York and a team of engineers in Hyderabad, India. And I got them all coordinated well and working together. So engineering really is like, what is this thing gonna do? How is it gonna work? You know, in the table Lego fiasco, the engineers came to me a month and a half in and said, our architecture is not right. And so we made a plan. We, we had, we made an engineering plan. We, we planned the architecture of this thing. And I think about it like agile waterfall discovery, agile implementation. So we made a plan and then we solicited that plan to the other, um, tech leads and product owners and application architects um, throughout our lab. And we asked for feedback and we asked for, you know, contrast and what did they think was right and what was wrong here. And we, we got what we thought was a solid plan. And then we created spikes of the known unknowns. So in agile, this is the term of a spike. And it was new to me when I started, but it, it's something that we did that made perfect sense which is spikes are time boxed investigations to reduce risk. The concept of the spike comes from rock climbing. So I do a lot of rock climbing. You guys can probably see in my garage where I have my office, I have a wall sitting right there. Um, and um, when you rock climb, you do one of three things now. You either do a top rope or you climb up and you, you know, somebody, the rope goes around the tree and they pull you up, you set, expandable camming devices into the rock as you climb and the person comes after you that clears them. But sometimes early on, particularly, and sometimes still now, you put pitons into the rock where they hammer them in. And those pitons don't make your current climb any easier, but they make it easier for everybody that comes after you. And that's what spikes are. They're time box investigations to take the things that are the most risky, figure out how to solve them, and then, and then um, have that in your plan. So we created spikes. And so we created a spike that was like, well, what is our overall engineering plan to make this happen? What, we created a spike that said, what are the dependencies that we're gonna have to get rid of? And how, how do we think we're gonna be able to do that? We created a spike that said, what are all the shared styles and how are we gonna consolidate them? We did a spike to identify all of the paddings and margins on all of the existing layouts. We did a lot of spikes to drill down the risk as much as we could. And then once we spiked the known unknowns, we buffered the unknown unknowns. So as part of our construction phase, as our plan for construction, we left about a 30% buffer for unknown unknowns because we knew there were gonna be lots of them. And then during the construction phase, and the idea is that if you get your engineering right and you do your planning right, you're still 
working agilely because you're still responding to what the team is doing and when, and sometimes things come up that you haven't thought about, which is why the buffer was there. But ideally, once you get to construction, you have a pretty good understanding of your plan and then you go and execute. Now, I'm not talking about waterfall. We're not building the space shuttle. We're, we're you know, building a detailed plan of what we're going to be doing five years from now in order. But we got as close to it as we could and we created a buffer for what we didn't know and then we executed. But still, things that would come up every step of the way. And so the, the, the key principle here was keep the milestones, but adjust scope. So we would keep doing the things that we said we were gonna do, but when something would come up that wasn't part of the plan, we would evaluate it for, does it have to be right, done right now? Does it impact everything else? Or can we put it into you know, one of the buckets that we said that we were gonna do right after? And so we would keep those milestones, but we adjusted the scope where we needed to. Then one of the things that was really critical and as part of thinking about this as a product is all along the way I was presenting every other week. Um, we had uh, org wide meetings where all of the product managers were presenting what the teams were working on. And so all along the way I was giving updates and, and continuing to build the tension about what we were releasing. And, and um, we had a, wrote a very comprehensive testing. So you have to really think about your test process, plan to test and also plan to roll out. And so here's what our test plan and rollout looked like. So we were planning to conclude development by you know the end of a particular sprint. We then were going to pilot adoption and we scheduled two week intervals with you know different teams where those teams were using the new, the new system and we were working with them to do that. I went to India for two weeks during that period for a hackathon. We had a number of hackathons where people were using the new system and uh, worked with the team there. And then we planned that the mass market adoption where we would, after our beta teams were done, there were things in order to adopt the new system. There was work that all of the application teams would need to do. Think about anytime FileMaker rolls out something new, and, it, and it's gonna break things. And you wish they would have told you it was gonna break things. Well, we knew all along the way, we were checking for what was gonna break. We were looking at all the existing layouts. We were looking at their applications. We had a way of switching back and forth between the old styling system, and the new styling system, and we were looking for anything that was gonna break. And so we would, we planned for that. And then we planned go live. You wanna build excitement, you wanna build tension. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, Carl Rogers um, put together a change model that uh, I can't even pronounce these names built on. There's a stages of change model. And the idea is that when people are going through transition between where they are and what could be, that gap between what is and what can be causes tension. You know, you can think about that tension in music. You can think about it in uh, the way when an airplane or a sailboat is, is cruising through the wind, there's a high pressure on one side and low pressure on the other side and that causes it to move. It's the same thing with people. Nancy Duarte talked about the same thing in her, uh, she wrote the books uh, Resonate and Slideology and she's mapped out some of the presentations of great speeches. She has a fantastic TED talk on great speeches. Uh, you should go look it up. And she talks that, that in those speeches, you want to constantly be contrasting between what is and what could be, and what is and what could be, and that gap in the middle is the tension. And so you wanted to, we were trying to build tension where people were really, they were going to have to do a lot of work to adopt this. And we knew that, but we wanted to, to make it so. And so we kept presenting, you know, what we had heard in the, in the hackathons. We were showing, you know, before and afters and before and afters and really building that tension. But we were also providing guidance. We built an application that listed everything that they were going to need to do and giving them examples of what were the problems and how it would look if it was broken and how it would look if it was going to be fixed. And so we provided them with all this information. And then we went to launch. And I am thrilled to say that launch went as planned. 
that the outcome of this is that the application developers told us that they were now designing you know twice as fast that they were not the problems that you know of the of the bugs that everything was consistent the the codes in our engineering code matched the numbers of the colors and the values in the pick list and what was on the screen and it was great and i have to say i felt really lucky that that happened but I'll also say that I believe that um, Branch Rickey, a baseball player in the 40s who opened the door for Jackie Robinson said that luck is the residue of design. You know, we, we worked really hard to make this so. And part of that was the shame and the memory of the previous project that took so long. Part of it was there was a lot on the line, but I felt lucky nonetheless. So, so now I have a question for you. My, my hope for you guys is that every curve looks like this, but I'm guessing that that's not true, that, that all of us have had curves that look like the one I showed you at the beginning. And I'm curious about what, you know, what your projects look like, which ones, you know, what's, what's working, what's not, what thoughts, what questions do you have? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts now. You can also email me after. Thanks. Uh, Don, I, thank you. That was, that was really interesting. Um, I, the first thing that, that popped into my head, you know, one of the biggest differences I think that most of us face as, um, as uh, you know, uh, independent developers is that we um, don't have a, uh, the same budgetary concerns as you you may have had now i'm sure you had a budget and i'm sure that you had you know certain limited resources but the way your budget works is you know maybe oh we're not going to meet a deadline we need more resources right it's a little bit different from this is going to cost you more money than i said it was going to cost mr client you know can you speak to that just a little bit sure so i have to tell you i that's totally true but I believe that this, uh, so right now, as we speak, I've got a team working with Proof that I'm partnering with on a new project and that's being rolled out today. And we used a lot of these same principles. Like, yeah, the budgets were bigger, but you know, I would say to you that you wanna think about any project that you're doing like a product. You're building internal products for the teams. You are, um, and the stakes are just as real. And so I, I would start out by thinking about any project as, you know, what am I going to do to land this thing? How am I going to do it? How do I, how do I give a fixed bid, even if you're not building that way, but what, how do I give a, you know, a very clear statement of when we're going to do this? How do I have to buffer it and how do I have to sell it? And, and how do I give guidance on, you know, what's going to go wrong and, and, ease that transition for them. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, and, and I don't, I don't want to monopolize things here, but uh, uh, just an, another thing that just a comment, really, you know, just the whole idea of, of looking at the process as a product is is pretty unique. Um, and you know, to, to me, I think that that for a lot of us um, to answer your, your question of earlier, which is, you know, how, you know, how does this look to you and how, how has have things gone for you in the past? You know, I think that we do kind of look at the end product as the product only. And then we look at this sort of long path that might look quite often like that Canyon that you had at the beginning, you know, where, you know, um, and, and by the way, that cycle did look very familiar. I've been through it many times that I'm sure that everyone here has, but, <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that, uh, that whole idea of, you know, designing the process itself is, I think, not as common as it probably should be. Cool. What other, what about uh, the rest? Don, yeah. thank you so much. Um, the part of the whole process I often have problems with is uh, getting buy-in as the new project gets a little bit closer what you were talking about building tension and building excitement. Um, for me, I experienced that part as building uh, resistance. 
<laughs> especially if you're changing processes internally, like when you're trying to change what has been a paper shuffling process to uh, an on-screen process. People get very comfortable with their paper shuffling. That's their method of security. And when you try to replace it, you're not getting excitement. What you're getting is resistance. Are there specific techniques you use to overcome that? Or do you experience sure. it? Absolutely. So I would say two things to this. The first is one of the things that was really hard for me to learn that I didn't learn for a long time is that people care about the outcome. They don't really care about the process and change is really, really hard. And one of the things I know from working as a psychologist with families is that homeostasis is a real thing. Homeostasis is the concept that in any system, when things start to heat up and change, somebody's going to sabotage it to try to bring the temperature back down because change is scary, right? And so the way you get through that is a combination of scaffolding for them that, you know, what's going to happen that change. That's what I was, say when I was saying, guide them, provide guidance and help them anticipate the problems and work through it. But it's also understanding what their motivation is, what are they fair, scared about, what the outcomes that they care about are, and how what you're doing is going to help that. And, and that's what you need to be selling. Not, they don't care that you're building an application or a form or whatever it is, they care about the outcome. I think there's an element of trust there. When you say to them, this new process is going to be wonderful. It's going to save you so much time and you won't have to wait for other people to send you paper. Um, they, they just don't have any reassurance or any trust that you're actually going to be able to deliver. I, I think that's absolutely true. And I am purposely strategic about it. So I talked about winning over the, the, the owners, the decision makers. It's the same in my projects. When I go to do a project in an organization, um, I'll have a kickoff meeting first with the owner or the, the key decision maker and then make sure I've got their buy-in. And then I will have a meeting with the full office staff telling them what we're gonna do, why we're gonna do it. And I situate myself, it sounds kind of obnoxious, but I sit myself at the head of the table with the, you know, the key decision maker next to me because I want to indicate, I've got this, I've got you guys, this is gonna be fine. You know, as a, as a psychologist and a parent, when a child doesn't feel, get the structure that they need, they'll act out and they'll continue to act out until you give them a containing structure. It's the same thing. People in an organization are anxious about the change. You have to let them know that you got it and it's all about trust and you know, making them feel safe. Thank you. That's a whole area of, uh, of uh, study that's, that's uh, a burgeoning field right now, you know, change management, right? There's been many books written on it. And uh, um, some of the reading that I've done, you know, talked about, you, you have to first understand the person's motivation for being afraid of, you know, what it is that's making them afraid. And usually it's pretty common sense things. It's like, you know, you know, I'm going to have to use this new software and I'm not going to learn it well enough and it's going to affect my ability to do my job. I, I know I can do my job well now. I don't know if I can do my job well with the new software or, um, or this software is going to replace me, you know, and, and I know I go to great pains to emphasize to the people I'm working with uh, on the, on the team that, uh, that, I don't believe that software can replace people that I don't believe that, that that's the goal, you know, that, that that's, it's, it's much more about making their job, making them more effective at their job so that they can actually be better at their job than they are now. And, you know, by having better answers and so forth, and that, that goes a long way, I think. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I totally agree. Don, hi, this is Alan. I want to thank you. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. I appreciate the thinking that went into that. Uh, may, I don't necessarily have a question. I just have more of an overview of what I deal with. I deal with lots of different types of cultures of people. Some clients do time and materials and they'll just pay for anything we do and they just keep making more and more requests. Some clients want a very firm timeline and milestones and they only pay on the milestones. 
and some do agile and some do waterfall. <laughs> You know, it's like I have to deal uh, with a lot of different cultures of uh, mindsets of different yeah. people in different parts of the world. So you had the luxury of one project, one team, one, you know, but uh, I'm constantly finding that projects go out of control. <laughs> you know, no matter how much I try to manage them and how much I try to get project managers or account managers, inevitably things get out of control. So those, that's my dilemma. <laughs> I, I can totally relate to that. I mean, I did custom projects for, you know, small groups and larger groups for about 10 years. And so I can totally relate to projects getting out of control and each place has a different way of operating. And so part of, part of the jiu-jitsu is figuring out who is your client and how can you, how can you use what they're doing in a way that helps you and helps them. Well, you were talking about the decision maker. A lot of times you're working really good with a cohort or project level, but the owner sort of stays and lurks in the background. And they don't really monitor the day to day, but they want that outcome like you're talking about. Fair. And how to engage them and bring them into the process. Like right now I'm working with uh, four companies want to merge, but they, they put me with a consultant, but the, you know, I want to satisfy the four owners of the companies that are merging, but I, I can't, I don't necessarily have access to them. So, you know, there's not a great answer to that, but I will tell you that one of the things I learned from David Knight is that um, any, I try never to take on a project unless I get to meet with the owners and, and have a relationship with them. And that's not always possible. And I have definitely taken projects where that's not the case. And I always pay for it later. Um, so I, I, I get that. I understand. And I, I, try to, I try to channel my inner David Knight when that comes up. <laughs> we all try to channel David Knight. It's true. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Bob Gossam, I, I, I like your concept, though, of, of building excitement. You know, so often we think, well, when you see it, you're going to like it. And that's not building excitement. It's, uh, but, but the idea of keeping in mind from the very beginning, bringing all the parts, getting all these parts of the team excited about where you're going is part of the project. I, 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 like, I like that idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that was the thing. Frankly, when I got hired as a product manager, I didn't know what that word meant. I had worked for, I had been a clinical psychologist and I worked for 10 years in, in FileMaker. And one of the first things that I learned is that the product manager has to own the vision and has to sell the vision to everybody else. And that was new for me, but it was really helpful to learn. And it's totally impacted the way I think about projects. Yeah. Frankly, all of us, what I found out was that, you know, all of us that are doing custom software, we're all product managers. We may be building internal products, we may be building external products like, you know, John and Todd, but we're all product managers in some way. And so putting on that product thinking has been very helpful for me as I've come back doing custom projects. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I think, I think you can even take that a step further. Um, I think, uh, one thing that I've learned over time is that not only do you have to make an initial sale to get the project in the first place, you have to keep selling the project, even to the people who gave you the green light in the first place. Um, I think you have to keep reminding them of what the goals are because sometimes they forget what the goals are. They forget why they signed on the dotted line in the first place. Um, and uh, you have to, you have to kind of, you know, and then you have to sell to the people who you're going to be, expecting to use the software as well throughout the project, you know, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's constant, but basically always be selling, you know, even to your own customers. And, and I just want to point out when I say sales, I'm thinking about Seth Godin's definition of sales. Seth Godin talks about sales being a transference of emotion and it's, and it's an emotion that's basically, you know, where people are thinking about where they are versus what could be. And so it's, it's, helping to transfer that motion, keep that vision going, keep that form motion. Um, 
So yeah, I totally agree with you, Bob. One of the things I thought when I first saw your swoopy chart was uh, it's the satisfaction of the client. <laughs> uh, when you start a project, you're all in that honeymoon period. And then as you ask them more questions and you're really not delivering much of anything unless you have a progressive delivery thing uh, or it's, it's making their lives more difficult because they have to give you time, they have to test things and they get more and more unhappy with you until they just absolutely hate you. And then you finally get to delivery and hopefully they love you again, you know? So that, that describes more than one confidence thing. I, I, I'm a year and a half, I'm almost two years into a renovation that's supposed to be nine months. And uh, we're living through it with four kids and so we're about to kill our contractor, so yes. So thank you. I'm, I'm happy to take more questions if you want, but I also know you guys have time for social stuff. So I can uh, hang back and listen if anybody wants a message you want to talk after or email me. It's been great to see you guys and to be with you again. And I appreciate the invitation. Th thank you very much, Don. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, lots there to think about. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, uh, this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, it's like you plant a little seed and then, you know, I'm going to be thinking about this stuff for days. So, uh, or, or longer, hopefully, because I should. <laughs> so, uh, thank, thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here and hope to see you uh, back here uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much uh, for today, for being here, everyone. Um, the I'm going to leave the the zoom session open for uh social time uh so feel free to, to jump in and and uh enjoy the conversation hey bob you're not recording